This video is brought to you by True Tales of Buried Treasure, the largest collection of old treasure magazines in the West. On our website, you can search for individual treasure stories by region, or buy our original magazines themselves. To pay us a visit, please click on the link in the description. Enjoy. One night in 1903, the weathered gunslinger Zwing Hunt beckoned his nephew Hugh to his bedside in a San Antonio hospital. After dismissing the nurse, he gestured towards a pair of weathered ornate boots in the corner. Reach into the toe of the left one, Huey. Hugh extracted a crumpled piece of paper containing a cryptic list detailing over $3 million worth of treasure, dated August 3, 1882, including a box of stolen diamonds, gold bars, silver ingots, Mexican coins, and two gold statues looted from a church. Now listen closely, Huey, Zwing continued. Billy Grounds and I hid it all near Davis Mountain after disposing of the old mechs who aided us, then incinerating the wagon and horses in Skeleton Canyon. Following Zwing's passing, Hugh made numerous failed attempts to locate the cache. Over time, others also pursued the rumored treasure of the infamous bandit Carlos Robles, all in vain. The wealth remains buried, untouched, for some 87 years in a desolate canyon in eastern Arizona. The saga began when the Arizona outlaw Curly Bill Brocious established himself in a strategic Kirikawa Canyon in 1881, plundering the territory between Tombstone and Bisbee towards Nogales. Curly Bill, a dapper figure with a penchant for dual pistols, preyed on Arizona cattle and Mexican travelers alike. One day, near Naco, he encountered Garcia Morales, a minor bandit with a sack of gold dust stolen from a miner. Sensing an opportunity, Morales disclosed Carlos Robles' plans to smuggle his riches across the border. Intrigued, Curly Bill swiftly dispatched Morales before his gang set off to intercept Robles. The encounter unfolded in bloodshed, leaving Morales silenced and the promise of riches entwined with treachery lingering in the desert air. He turned to one of his men, a cattle rustler named Jim Hughes, Hailing from Bisbee, Hughes was the outlaw offspring of an Arizona copper miner and a Mexican woman. In his 30s, he possessed a swarthy demeanor and a shrewdness that belied his years, fluent in both Spanish and English. You heard what this bandito said. Could be he was talking straight, Zwing remarked. Could be, Hughes muttered. I've heard rumblings that Mexico's becoming too hot for Robles. Suppose you venture into Mexico for a while. Maybe Nogales is a good place to start. I've heard whispers that Robles has allies there. See what you can uncover. Jim Hughes, resourceful and cunning, also bore a striking resemblance to a Mexican. After several days of absence, he returned with valuable intelligence. Robles and his gang, over a dozen strong, were concealed in the Sierra de la Madera in Chihuahua, near the town of Penuelas, just 20 miles from the border. True to Morales' words, Robles was preparing a train of burros to transport his accumulated wealth across the border, evading notice by skirting Nogales to the east and heading northeastward through the desolate San Simon Valley and the surrounding mountains via Skeleton Canyon. Despite his meticulous planning, Robles' ultimate destination remained a mystery. When Hughes returned to Curly Bill's hideout in the Kirikawas, he found the gang leader absent, off on a trip to Bisbee with no expected return date. Displeased by the diversion, Hughes resolved to take matters into his own hands. With the promise of a fortune at hand, he sought to assemble his own gang. Under the cover of night, Hughes slipped away from the Chiricahua camp and journeyed to Tombstone, where he recruited a motley crew of followers. Among them were Zwing Hunt, a seasoned tough in his late fifties, and Billy Grounds, a brash and eager young gunslinger. Rounding out the group were Nevada Joe Lyons, Will Brennan, Sam Oakridge, Will Newbold, and Phil Harvey, a collection of saddle tramps with a knack for handling firearms and a bounty on some of their heads. On August 1, 1882, the newly formed gang set out from Tombstone towards Skeleton Canyon. Hughes and Zwing chose a strategic position for an ambush, nestled between a steep canyon wall and a dense hillside. Hughes instructed Billy Grounds to take the horses ahead to Silver Spring and secure them a task which Grounds begrudgingly accepted. Once Grounds departed, Hughes divided the remaining men into two groups, each ascending opposite slopes of the canyon to establish concealed campsites. 
The stage was set for the impending confrontation with Robles and his band of outlaws. With nothing left to do but await the outcome, they held their breath, hoping Hughes's information held true. The pack train appeared around mid-morning on August 3rd, led by Carlos Robles, a clean-shaven man in his 40s sporting a wide-brimmed vaquero hat and crisscrossed bandoliers over his charro jacket. Behind him trailed the heavily laden train of 26 burros, each carrying two cowhide sacks brimming with treasure, accompanied by 14 members of Robles's band. They proceeded slowly, the riders flanking the plodding burros, chatting, smoking, and singing without a scout in sight. Robles himself exuded a relaxed, carefree demeanor, having successfully navigated his men and their loot across the border, deftly avoiding Mexican army patrols, with only a minor skirmish with hostile Indians marring their journey. From his hillside lookout, Zwing observed the riders below, while across the canyon, Hughes took aim at Robles's back. The bullet that pierced Robles's heart signaled a devastating crossfire. Caught off guard, eight of Robles's men fell in the initial barrage, leaving the survivors disoriented and desperate to flee. Bandits, burros, and riderless horses bolted in every direction between the narrow canyon walls, pursued by relentless gunfire from above. As Hughes and his men descended to the canyon floor, they encountered a scene of gruesome chaos, littered with corpses and spilled treasure. After accounting for the dead and searching for survivors, Hughes and his crew rounded up the remaining burrows, discovering three were missing, having fled westward through Skeleton Canyon towards the open mesas. In the aftermath, speculation in Tombstone and Bisbee swirled about the fate of the missing burrows and their cargo, with theories ranging from chance encounters with cowhands to deliberate acts of concealment. As Hughes and his men gathered the hijacked loot, Zwing meticulously tallied their spoils on a scrap of paper, intent on keeping a record. Reluctant to risk suspicion by transporting the treasure back on horseback, they buried it beneath a big live oak east of Silver Spring. The prospect of burying the banditos and disposing of the horse carcasses loomed large, prompting a hasty departure from the canyon the following morning. Returning to Tombstone, Hughes encountered Deputy Sheriff Healy, who questioned his whereabouts during the past few days. With a plausible alibi, Hughes evaded suspicion, although Healy cautioned him to lay low until tensions with Curly Bill Brocious subsided. With the memory of the ambush still fresh, Hughes couldn't help but feel a sense of unease lingering in the air. Evidently, Curly Bill had his suspicions that Hughes had gathered a crew and set off to claim Robles' treasure. He likely knew of Zwing Hunt's involvement, and perhaps even Billy Grounds and some of the saddle tramps. However, he remained unaware that the ambush had already taken place, and the loot was safely hidden. After contemplating his next move, Hughes sought out Zwing to discuss their predicament. Hughes recounted his conversation with the deputy sheriff, and Zwing listened intently, nodding in understanding. It seems Curly Bill has caught wind of our scheme, Zwing remarked, his gaze sharp. What's our plan now? Jim Hughes grinned cunningly. He had it all figured out. He intended to return to Curly Bill's hideout in the Chiricahua Canyon and smooth things over. Hughes would explain that he had acted alone in hijacking the pack train because Curly Bill was absent, emphasizing the need for caution and patience. I'll assure him the stash is secure where it lies, and three million is worth waiting for until the coast is clear. Meanwhile, Hughes then unveiled his plan for a second betrayal. While he kept Curly Bill distracted, Zwing and Billy Grounds would retrieve the loot from Skeleton Canyon, relocate it to a safer spot, and cut out Brennan, Sam Oakridge, and the other saddle tramps from the deal. Zwing grasped the plan quickly. So we're also leaving out the other five, he surmised. Any objections? None from me. The fewer involved, the better, replied Zwing with a sly grin. Thus, while Zwing and Billy set off for Skeleton Canyon, Hughes departed for the Kirikawas. His return to Curly Bill's hideout surprised the gang leader, who regarded Hughes with suspicion. Yet Hughes managed to allay any doubts, and everything proceeded smoothly. Hughes was content with his cunning plan, eagerly awaiting the opportune moment to slip away and reunite with Zwing and Billy to abscond with the treasure. However, Zwing had different intentions. As he and Billy journeyed toward Skeleton Canyon, Zwing proposed a further betrayal, Yur, to cut out Hughes and keep the treasure for themselves. If we hold out on Hughes, Billy reasoned, he'll come looking for us. 
He'll be too busy staying alive with Curly Bill and the others on his tail, Zwing chuckled, and I know just the place for us to disappear. The notion excited Billy, and as they rode, Zwing painted a vivid picture of their future. They would split the treasure, leave Arizona behind, and embark on new lives. Zwing envisioned a lavish existence in San Francisco for himself, while Billy dreamed of becoming a wealthy cattle baron in New Mexico. Their reverie was interrupted by the approach of an old Mexican farmer, Luis Hernandez, whom they coerced into aiding their scheme. They directed him to Skeleton Canyon, where the grisly aftermath of the ambush awaited them. After relocating the treasure and dispatching Hernandez, they left the scene under cover of night, heading south towards their newfound sanctuary, the Chandler Ranch near Charleston. Unbeknownst to them, their actions had set in motion a chain of events that would soon engulf Tombstone in turmoil. The discovery of the massacre in Skeleton Canyon, coupled with the disappearance of Hernandez, sent shockwaves through the town. Meanwhile, Curly Bill and Hughes remained in the dark, unaware of the treachery brewing within their own ranks. That evening, he once more slipped away from camp, this time on a quest to locate Zwing. His actions upon finding Zwing and Billy Grounds would hinge on the information he gleaned from them. However, fate intervened and it was Deputy Sheriff Healy who stumbled upon them first. After days of scouring the surrounding area with posse men Jack Young and Joe Madera, they arrived at the Chandler Ranch on the morning of August 22nd. Though Zwing and Billy were present, Jack Chandler and his hand, Charlie Osborne, were away searching for strays. In a tense confrontation, Billy Grounds, in a panic, opened fire. His shots mortally wounded Madera and grazed Healy, while Young sustained a bullet wound to the thigh. In the ensuing chaos, Billy Grounds was fatally shot, and Zwing was gravely injured, taking two bullets to his lungs. Upon Jack Chandler and Osborne's return, they hastily tended to the wounded, loading them into a wagon and rushing them to Tombstone. Despite their efforts, Billy Grounds succumbed to his injuries before they reached the hospital. Once there, it was determined that Healy's wound was minor, and Young was expected to recover. Zwing, however, faced a dire prognosis with bullets lodged in his lungs. Despite his critical condition, a guard was posted outside his hospital room. Remarkably, Zwing's condition improved, and he was on the road to recovery when a stranger arrived in Tombstone. This stranger, Hugh Hunt from San Antonio, claimed to be Zwing's nephew, having read about the gunfight in a Texas newspaper and traveled to visit his uncle. The following day, Hugh Hunt made his way to the hospital, where he incapacitated the guard and spirited Zwing away on horseback. Fleeing town, Zwing became a wanted man, hunted by Jim Hughes and Arizona law enforcement. For a while, Zwing's whereabouts remained a mystery until rumors surfaced that he and Hugh had encountered hostile Indians in the Swiss Helm Mountains, resulting in fatal injuries for Zwing. However, the veracity of this tale was uncertain. Meanwhile, Deputy Sheriff Healy and his posse discovered a grave matching the reported location alongside the bodies of three slain hostiles, presumably killed by Zwing and his nephew. Reflecting on the events later, Deputy Sheriff Healy admitted that their mistake lay in not uncovering the grave, suspecting it would have been empty. Despite numerous attempts, Jim Hughes and Curly Bill failed to locate the treasure in Skeleton Canyon. While Curly Bill met his end in a gunfight, Hughes fled with a sack of currency, eventually disappearing in California. In the years following, treasure hunters descended upon Skeleton Canyon, yet the loot remained elusive. Zwing, however, lived on in Mexico, prospecting for gold in the Sierra Madres. Despite finding enough to sustain him, he eventually returned to the U.S. for medical treatment in San Antonio. Sadly, his ailments proved fatal, but before passing, he disclosed the exact location of the cache to his nephew, Hugh Hunt. Despite several attempts, Hunt abandoned the search, as did others who followed in his footsteps. Thus, the treasure of bandit chief Carlos Robles, valued at $3 million, remains undiscovered to this day. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to read the original article or purchase the magazine from which it was taken, please check out our website, truetalesofburiedtreasure.com.